program the seventh character of the your uh, your call sign field, you're screwed. So too bad. Um, every so often, D Star uh, Icon puts on a big marketing push. There's a lot of flurry around D Star, and hey, D Star is the greatest thing. Hey, gaming. And uh, uh, Icom has just announced some uh, some deep deep discounts on D Star repeaters again. Um, to encourage people to, you know, to, to buy D-Star, buy into D-Star. As some of you may have seen, Yezu has announced their digital voice. Um, uh, they announced it with a big flurry and then it's been sort of quiet. Uh, so uh, thought we'd go through and talk about not how do you program D-Star, but what is it and what advantages and disadvantages does it have. All right. D-Star is really, when, we, when most people talk about D-Star, they're talking about two very different things. One is digital voice in the ham bands, and two is a network for linking the repeaters that gives you, lets you do all sorts of interesting things about uh, routing, routing messages a, a, across these repeaters or, or routing voice across these repeaters. And people kind of combine the two together when they talk about D-Star, but they really are two very different well, not very different things, but they really are two different pieces of the puzzle. So, digital communications framework is based on a league that the ja uh, Japanese Amateur Radio League created, a, a specification for digitizing voice, taking voice, which is normally analog, and turning it into digital information that can be sent as, of, as, as if it was data. Um, Human voice, as I'm sure most of you know, carries a lot of different frequencies, uh, milliseconds, microseconds apart. This is actually the word let. This is somebody, it's a, it happens to be a male because you can see the frequencies are rather low, 5,000 hertz, 3,000 hertz, 500 hertz. But this is, this is somebody saying the word let. The, uh, the amplitude is the, uh, is, is the um, height, the frequency is the, uh, this axis and the time over time is that, uh, that other axis that goes that way. Now, a, a different way to look at it, you've probably seen this, you've all seen this on, uh, if nothing else, you've all seen it on CSI when they're comparing, you know, is this mat voice sample match, right? And what's happening here is this is time, that's amplitude, and then how close the squiggles are is, is the frequency of the voice. So how do we turn that into zeros and ones? At least 60 years ago, the Bell Labs discovered that you can sample voice, you can take little pieces of, of, of speech and just send those pieces and at the other end people will still be able to understand what's being said. Now this is conceptual, I'm not trying to draw you know, exactitude, but so in other words, if we, if, if, Every couple of milliseconds, we take a millisecond sample of the voice at that point in time. We can, take, we can send just that down the line. At the other end, as long as we blow it back up and put the right spacing in there, people will hear it. They'll hear the voice, and most people won't hear any difference. It might sound a little tinny, but that's about it. They'll actually be able to hear it. So the first step is you sample, you sample the voice. I know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm being... That our, our two audio engineers back there going, oh, why could we tell him something? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, if you don't do it right, it, it, that's how it, uh. We got that. Okay. Actually, to, to that point, sorry, John, the hijack, but it's the same technology as using cell phones these days. So that's yes. why if you lose, and you'll get to this, I'm sure, if you lose parts of data, that's why it gets to on that. So yeah, then you've heard, you've all heard that in your cell phones. But this is, this, that ability is 60, over, over 60 years old. The uh, Bell system, AT&T, was using it on their long lines to be able to get more messages with the same piece of wire, more phone calls on the same piece of wire. But once you take a sample, then you can start digitizing it by, by, by assigning specific values, binary values, to represent your frequency and represent your amplitude. Now what I've got here is just something ridiculously simple. Obviously this is not the way it would really work. Um, but, you know, for an example, they're using 
the, the rightmost five digits, rightmost five bits to represent the frequency, and the, the, the leftmost three to represent the amplitude. In reality, for human voice, it's a lot more complicated because you have to deal with chords, major chords, minor chords. Chords are where your voice is producing multiple frequencies at once. You think about a piano, if you hit one key versus you hit a couple of keys at the same time, a couple of keys at the same time is a chord. And a lot of our speech is chords and things like that. So it's, it's much more complicated than this, but this is the basic concept. Once I've taken a sample, I can then encode it. And the word is encode. Encoding is allowed under the FCC regulations. It simply means a representation without trying to hide the meaning. So that's, that's the basic concept be behind digital voice. <clears throat> Since we have digital, once we convert it into zeros and ones, we don't have to use FM anymore. There are all sorts of other modulation techniques that we can use. One of the most common is GMSK, which stands for Gaussian Minimum Shift Keying. I, I don't know what it means, but it's very efficient in the use of the spectrum. Okay, it, when you have your cell phone, and your cell phone, you know, when, you, when, the, when they advertise, well, our 4G network is bigger than their 4G network, the G that they're talking about is GMSK. And it's just different releases or different uh, um, uh, generations of the GSM, uh, GMSK. How does that differ from like PSK or something like that? Speaks the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and well, just, just, no, just so there's no confusion, <laughs> I fully expected Fred to explain to start explaining it. So. He's the analog guy. Yeah. Okay. So the result, if you use GMSK, is you can get a bandwidth of 6.25 um, kilohertz. Normal FM is what we normally do as FM on our radios is 16 kilohertz. So that means we can get a much narrower bandwidth, which means you can get more signals in the same amount you know, of, of, of amateur band. If everybody goes to that bandwidth. If they don't, well, then you have a, <laughs> then you sort of waste it. But uh, by the way, don't forget that sideband is only 2.5 kilohertz. So this is still a lot bigger than sideband, but it's the best you can do when you're trying to send digital like this. Um, if you converted everything into zeros and ones, you have enough room to, to actually send some data along with your, your, your represented voice. In fact, you can send routing information and you can send data. In the D-Star world, this particular thing is called DV. There's also some called DD, digital voice. And then there's DD, which is digital data which is very high speed data, we're not really going to talk about it. It's up in the 23 centimeter band and above, um, 128K throughput as opposed to 1.2K <coughs> throughput of, of typical packet. Um, but this is a D-star packet, I'm not going to go through all the detail, but there's ID data, there's voice, there's digital, more voice, more digital, blah, blah, blah. You notice there's checksum information so it can tell if it's got a problem. Some of the information that it carries is forward error correcting information, um, which means that when the signal gets, what are you doing? When the signal gets to the other end, if it gets distorted, if it gets corrupted, there's information that may enable it to correct itself. So that's forward error correction. Um, so you've got, you've got the ability to send routing information, identification information, voice and data all in the same signal. Right now, with respect to ham radio, there are two major methods of, of going digital. One is D-Star, which we're kind of talking about. Uh, the standard itself is open. This, we're going to have a, we're going to talk about that. Is it proprietary or not? Because that's one of the big questions. The standard is an open standard. Anybody can, if you can program it, you can, you can do it. Um, there's also P25, which some of you have heard of. It's the, it's, it's the standard that's used for most uh, public service radios. 
it has not been in the amateur use at all because the equipment is too expensive. However, that was the first, gen first and second generations of P25 equipment, and most everybody is getting rid of their P25 and replacing it. They have to because the old P25 equipment was 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth, and the FCC has mandated 6.25 kilohertz bandwidth. And what most people are doing, rather than try to convert it, is they're just junking what they have and buying new stuff. Because it just, it, it, it actually, in many cases, just costs more to convert, to try to convert the existing equipment. Which means there's gonna be a hell of a lot of P25 stuff on the market at rather low cost. So we could very well see um, P25 stuff coming into the amateur market. That's probably why ICOM is making another big push right now. They want to forestall that push because that will be really low cost equipment. The Yezu, the new Yezu stuff is uh, not D Star and it's not P25. It's some new uh, en encoding scheme that they've invented for themselves. They're using a different type of modulation. TDNM, so TDMA, something like that. Um, uh, it's a 12 and a half ba K bandwidth on the, on the new Yezu stuff. This should be interesting. You know, they announced it and then they've sort of like aren't saying anything about it because what they're doing is they're taking uh, a, a sub market, a subset of the market that's already small and not terribly profitable, and they're coming in with a competing product that's not um, compatible with anything that's already in the market. Sounds like a that's a winner. Sounds like a real yeah. Sounds like a real winner. Unless it comes in at a very low price. Unless it comes in at a very low price or has some super great you know application, application which so far nobody's seen. Uh, their brochure is very funny and says, "Well, you know, the D Star uses the old GMSK standard. That's an ancient standard. Well, um, you know, GMSK guys. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we'll have to see what happens with their stuff." All right, what's happening inside the radio? You have your microphone. The analog voice from the microphone goes into what's called a codec. A codec is a computer phrase meaning a coder decoder. Some people say it's an encoder decoder. In the same way, modem is a made up word that stands for modulator, demodulator. Codec is encoder decoder. And that codec translates that analog voice into bits, zeros and ones. It then goes into whatever is in the radio to, hand, to do GMSK stuff, and then it goes into the radio to do normal radio stuff like an amplifier and you know, uh, VFO or VCO and all the rest of that good kind of stuff, and then of course it goes out to your antenna. Nobody's laughing at my joke. <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. That's how I take term stuff. Huh? The high tech terms. Yeah, stuff. the high tech terms. I thought the duck was supposed to be. Yeah, the, the, the rubber ducky. It's a rubber ducky. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Damn it. I go for sure. You get points for that. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, when it comes back, the, the GMS, uh, GMSK stuff uh, extracts the bits. The bits go into the codec, the codec translates them back into analog voice, and it goes out to the speaker. Now, in pretty much every one of these radios, there's also a regular old analog FM side. So at some point, there's, a, you know, there's basically a splitter here that says, if you're an FM signal, I treat you one way. If you're a GMSK signal, I treat you the other way, depending what you've programmed and what you've set in your radio, say what mode do you want to use. But this is different modulation technique. It's not FM. And you've got this codec. It's not codec, it's codec. Um, Are you having a moment? Huh? Are you having a codec moment? Yes, <laughs> I'm having a codec moment. <laughs> yes. D-Star uses a, a codec called AMBE from a company called Digital Voice Systems Inc., DVSI. You'll hear, anytime you read about, about D-Star, you'll hear references to the AMBE codec, or you'll hear references to DVSI. That's what it is. The codec is the thing that translates the analog into the digital and vice versa. It's very sophisticated computer programming. One of the first things you'll hear is, oh, D-Star's proprietary. Is D-Star proprietary? Well, 
You know the old the old line from Bill Clinton. It depends on what your definition definition of is. 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 <laughs> okay. So D star itself is an open spec. The translation from the analog voice into the digital is an open spec that the Japanese Amateur Radio League published, and anybody can read that spec and try to try to do what they want. The AMBE codec, however, is heavily copyrighted and patented. Software can be copyrighted. It would be very difficult to write your own codec without inadvertently, let alone vertently, <laughs> without inadvertently violating some of their copyrights. Okay, this is this is something that's been happening in software a lot, where people people copyright routines, they copyright techniques, and then anybody who it, You've never read their code, you have no idea that that's what they're doing, but <clears throat> two programmers are often going to come up with the same solution to the same problem. And when that happens, they say, hey, you're, you know, you're violating my copyright. You, you can violate a copyright without ever having seen the other guy's work. So it's very difficult to build your own codec. No, Anthony? That's not right. What? <laughs> Sorry. Patents, yes. Copyrights. Sorry, patents. Sorry, patents. Patents. Sorry. Patents. Okay, patents. I thought it was a copyright. No, copyrights. Copyright, um, you have to copy it. Uh, or you have to have access of a copyright. Okay, but I can... But access I can, plus substantial... I can violate copyrights. the patent. But, if two, but a patent you can violate yeah. without even... Okay, patent. Around. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. Minor technical point. All right. Um, so there are some amateurs who have built their own, who have written their own codec, completely matches the, the, the standard, uh, but they've never gone commercial with it because they know that the first thing that would happen is DBSI would come, would descend on them with about 10,000 lawyers and you know, tie them up in court for the next 20 years. Yeah, well, was patent lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, Especially the ones that are going down south. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> They're very. F the other thing is that the ha in general, the, the the major manufacturers of ham radio equipment have not des have decided to not follow on with the ICOM product. They didn't want to give ICOM the credit. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't want it to seem as if ICOM was was successful or ICOM had come up with something really super duper. So there's very few non ICOM pieces of equipment on the market. I think there's right now, they're actively, there's a repeater. That repeater uses the AMBE codec. Okay, but it's just, it's not an ICOM um, uh, repeater. <coughs> Notice ICOM did trademark the name D-Star. The, the Japanese um, uh, standard does not refer to it as D-Star. Just, ref I, can't, I can't remember exactly what it calls it, but D-Star is actually a trademark for, uh, uh, trademark or patent? Trademark. <laughs> trademark, sorry, they, yeah, trademark, the name yeah. D-Star. So this repeater is a repeater that talks with ICOM D-Star equipment. That's how they sell it. <laughs> um, the FCC and most other countries consider D-Star to be encoding because it's an open standard. The French and a couple of countries consider it to be encryption because there's only one source and they disallow it for amateur use. Yeah. And there's still, there's legal battles in France, and Russia keeps changing its mind every couple of years, things like that. All right, so what can I do with it that I can't do with a regular FM analog radio? Why is, why is it so hot? Or what's so great about it? And just remember that every time you press the button, there is control information, there's ID <coughs> data, there's voice data, and there's data data going out, out of your radio. The first and most interesting, not most interesting, but the first most basic use is that I can send identifying information on my initial call-up. Now, let's understand that I'm not saying that this thing, if I say WB2RYV, it translates that into data that, that can be acted upon. I have to program that into the radio. I actually have to go press buttons, go to a menu function, put in my call. I have to press some more buttons, go to another program function that puts in, for example, if I want to, if I just want to call CQ. And I'm doing it with a numeric only keypad. 
go back 10 years to cell phones and when you're sending text messages and you know, for the letter A you press the one key, one, you know, one, two, three, uh, sorry, once, for B you pressed it twice, for C you pressed it three times, is that kind of thing. So it can be a little bit fun to, to program this in. They sell programming software for it. It has lots of memory, so you can put all of your regularly used frequencies, all of your regularly used combinations into your radio, and then just select it. Okay, CQ for me is number one. That's the most basic thing. And if I want to call Doug, WA1SFH, and I want to call him for me, I might, you know, and I do that a lot, I'll have him as number two. And I just go to that memory. But you do have to program this stuff in. It's not taking your voice and translating it into data. It's a separate set of programs. <coughs> so great, I've... But is it coming out as audio, or is it data to data? Data to data. Okay. And what happens, you... Did you, excuse me, did you just say that you by, you've logged me in by a routing, by a routing program, or...? No, I haven't said that yet. Oh. Okay, but what I'm saying is, let's say I know that I call you a lot. Yes. And I want to just what, talk... No, what do you call me? That's a secret. Yeah. Uh, anyway. You're welcome. Um, it's patented. <laughs> Actually, that one would be copyright. That would be a trade secret. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's say I know I call you a lot. Right. I would pre-program in WA1SFH as a your call, I would program in WB2R, YB is my call, because that's always uh, my call, and I would put that in memory someplace. So if I know I want to talk to you, I would flip right to memory position two, or memory position 240, or wherever I put it, mm -hmm. because I've already got that programmed in. If I suddenly decide that I want to talk to somebody um, that I've never talked to before, and I want to program in their information, I have to sit there in the field, punching numbers on this numeric keypad. Okay. Now, do I have to do that? Answer no. I can just point, I can just have one of the things you can put in is CQ. CQ means a general call to anybody. If I have CQ in there, I can talk to anybody. If I say CQ, every D Star radio in the room will open up and you know you'll hear me talking. Okay. But one of the things that happens is when I push that push to talk, it sends out this information of what's programmed in, which memory I'm using and it displays that on the radio. So if I have programmed in that I'm John in Stanford, Connecticut, when I push this button, the D-Star radios in this room will see John in Stanford, Connecticut. The one problem, it's a really annoying slow text yeah. call. <laughs> By the time you see all that information you've already answered, you've pretty much finished the conversation with me. And it's also difficult to read while driving. You know, it would be faster on a, on a mobile or a base station rig, but it's still, you know, <laughs> crash. <laughs> okay. So it's a great idea, but in practice, it turns out not to be so great simply because it, it just takes too long. It's nobody, nobody spends, but nobody sits there waiting going, gee, you know, let's see. So, John, that's because when you, when you key up and talk, you're saying CQ. I don't have to say CQ. If I've got this set to CQ, when I push that push to talk, it's sending out CQ, D, E, W, it, not voice, nobody's going to hear it, but I'll see, everybody else will see a crawl on the bottom of their screen that says CQ, D, E, W, V, 2, R, Y, V, John, in Stanford, Connecticut. If they're watching the screen. If they're watching the screen. And if they don't, they have no idea that you're calling. Uh, well, presumably I'm also going to say something. Presumably, I'm also using my voice. I don't have to. Okay. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things, of course, is that if people do that, now when they chunk the repeater, you know who's going to chunk the repeater. Okay. But I don't have to say anything. I, I can no, just don't go to Easter. Yep. I just go like that, and it sends out that data. And I can say, you know, I can say CQ. This is uh, KB1 QBZ. But meanwhile, the radio is sending out CQ. This is WB2RYV. Whatever. It, it, the, what I'm sending by voice has no relationship, there's no automatic relationship to what's being sent out via the, the data. It's whatever I've programmed in. So when I stole your radio, it's still transmitting your call? Yes. Right. Unless you change it. That's right. Okay. 
So one of the things that we can do is use that identification information to limit squelch break. I'm sitting there, I really, I don't really want to hear from anybody but WB2RYV. I'm KB1QBZ. Those of you who know the joke, yes, I talk to myself a lot. Um, QBZ is an old call sign of mine. Um, so I program my radio that I just want to hear from KB1QBZ, or I want to hear from somebody who's calling me. That's the more likely scenario. I don't want to hear anybody except if they're putting out a call to me. And then I can use what's called call sign squelch. And I set my radio with call sign squelch so that if the data, remember it's the data that matters, if the data coming through says KB1QBZ, I'm going to, that's somebody calling me is KB1QBZ, my radio is going to unsquelch and I'm going to hear the voice. The other guys, QZH and K1FC, if they have their call sign squelch active, they won't hear the call. Their radios will, will see that it's not calling them, and their radio will say, I'm not going to unsquelch. Because he told me he only wants to see people calling him. But it's still digital calling, not, I it's not, digital. not voice. Right. I can be calling, I can, I, you know, I can have this thing programmed so that the, digitally it's calling KB1QBZ. But voice, I can be saying K1FC, this is WB2RYV. Anybody who is unsquelched will hear me say K1FC, but in fact, the, the only radio that will unsquelch is KB1QBZ, because the data is saying KB1QBZ. So when you hit the voice, they will not open normal repeater access. Well, let's, let's not talk about repeaters yet. This is just the radio. This okay. is just, I'm, not, I'm just doing simplex here. Now, for this to work, I have to have programmed it in on my side, and those guys have to have programmed it in and said, I want the call sign squelch. One of the things that you'll find in DSTAR a lot is that for these nice features to work, it depends on me doing things right, and it depends on those guys doing things right. And we all know how, how much we can rely on hams to do things right. Okay. So those, if those guys don't do it right, the feature, the feature goes away. One other thing to remember, the frequency is still in use. Even though their radio didn't unsquelch, they can't have their own conversation on the same frequency. And they don't know why. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the right. That's right. right. Yeah. And this, this is one of the real problems, and it causes a terrible problem. Yeah. And there are people, you know, who, who punch people out because I was busy talking with somebody, and you suddenly opened up on the frequency as if I wasn't there, you son of a bitch. And, and there actually been people punched out. Well, I never heard you. I opened up because I never heard you. I had call sign squelch on, and I never heard a conversation. And in fact, what can, what can happen is this guy here, right, I go to him. If he doesn't, once I start the conversation with him, if he then doesn't set his radio to talk to me, then these guys will hear his part of the conversation, but not my part of the conversation, which drives everybody nuts. Is there a conversation going on? Why can't I hear the other side? What's going on here? Did, did somebody stop talking? So you hear somebody say, uh, you know, okay, George, uh, you know, it's been good to talk to you, and sounds to be, now I'm not hearing anything, sounds to me like the QSO is over. Meanwhile, George is rattling on about something, so I open up, and the guy says, what are you doing? George is busy talking. So well, it, it actually- two RYV is a lid. Yes, that's right. And, and it actually causes a lot of consternation, is a good word. Okay. We can also, remember, you can send data while you're transmitting, while you're voice, while you're doing voice. So, for example, you can send GPS data. And uh, th this is the ICOM um, 2820. 20, yeah, 2820. And it's got a little a nice, a nice display on it. If, if, if you've got a GPS connected to it, actually, it, if you take the D-Star option, you get a GPS whether you like it or not on this radio. Um, uh, it will show you where the other station is. So you can go cut his coax when you... <laughs> I can go or if we're both driving, I can, you know, I can make sure I ram him head on and sue him, you know, things like that. Um, no, seriously. Uh, 
it's, it's, it, will, it will show you that information. Now, notice something I said. If you get the D star, you also get the GPS. One of the little tricks, I don't understand why ICOM did this, because it's created such confusion. A lot of their radios say D star capable. That means they're not selling it with the D star module in it. They're not selling it with the chip, with the AMBE chip. You're gonna buy that separately. So, hey, wow, here's an ICOM D star radio. It's only $300, I'm gonna buy it. I take it home, it turns out it doesn't do D star because I have to spend another $130 to get the D star. And on that particular radio, they, they bundled the D-Star chip in with the GPS. So if you, wanted to buy, if you wanted to go D-Star, you bought the basic radio, plus this bundled GPS uh, D-Star chip, which was $180, almost $200, people were furious. So be careful, D-Star ready, D-Star capable, D-Star available. Not all of the ICOM D-Star radios actually come with D-Star if you buy them thinking that you're getting D-Star. You've got to be careful. Okay. Obviously, there are limits to how much data you can send while you're also doing voice. If I want to send a 15K spreadsheet, you know, what's going to happen when I, I'm, I'm busy talking, I release the push to talk, it stops sending. You know? So, you, while it can send data while you're doing voice, there's a limit to, to what you want to do in that mode because when you're having a voice conversation, you're constantly releasing the push to talk, pressing the push to talk, releasing, and that's going to interrupt your data flow. So you have to, you know, you, you have to think through that whether it's really going to give you all that much, or how you're going to use it. Now you can send data without a TNC or a sound card adapter. You just need to, you just need an audio interface into the radio, because it's taking care of taking data and putting it into packets and all that good kind of stuff. All right, um, the DV. All of these two meter and 440 radios are at about 956 BPS. Packet, basic packet is 1,200 BPS. So just a, a shade under regular basic packet. It provides forward error correction on the data. It does not provide ARQ. Most packet provides ARQ, automatic retransmission request, which means that if a, if a packet is corrupted, when it gets to the other side, the other side can request a repeat. And that's one of the reasons why packet is pretty reliable, because if anything's corrupted, it can ask for a repeat. The forward error correction will sometimes help it uh, eliminate the need for a repeat, but sometimes there's a repeat needed. It has no way of doing that. The, this DV, um, has been used very effectively at a number of major public uh, public service events, the Marine Corps Marathon, where they have these things out of all the aid stations. They have them uh, all at, at the dropout stations. They've got the mats for runners at, at a race, runners, uh, a big race like that, runners run over these mats, which records their, their numbers to make sure that everybody ran the whole course. And, you know, they send that from, uh, they send that back in through, through D-Star. There's no reason why you couldn't use packet and a TNC. Um, but they were using with the, with uh, with the star, it, it works pretty well. It's not a. But remember, you know, you can go out and buy a TNC for your packet or for your regular FM radio. It will work just as well. And things like the D710 come with a TNC built in, so I don't even have to buy a TNC. So just remember that. Um, and that's just what I just said. So, all right. D star needs D star repeaters. It's not FM. People keep forgetting. They think it's FM. It's GMSK. So a regular FM repeater will not hear it and will not be able to retransmit. So people have to get D star repeaters. The D star repeaters are freaking expensive, like five, six thousand dollars for one for one band. Uh, ICOM has been discounting them dramatically for for a number of years. They were just giving them away to try to build up but they are expensive. Uh, one thing you'll see, you'll constantly see, hear people referring to, it sounds like magic, this concept of a module. People will tell, oh, I've got the B module and the C module and there's the G module, which really isn't a module, but everybody talks about it like it's a module. All it means is, by some standard, who knows what, module A is if you have a 23 centimeter repeater, module B is if you have the 70 centimeter, module C is if you have 
the two meter. But it sounds really, oh, wow, really super cool. It's just, which repeater you got? Yeah. Uh, point? Yes. It says the D star repeater cannot transmit analog FM. Right. What about what's in your hand? This has two radios in it. Remember, if I set this to FM, the FM side of this radio is a regular analog FM radio. If I set it to data, then it's a GMSK radio using the, uh, using the uh, AMB codec. So any of these radios, they're really, there are two radios in here, an FM radio and a GMSK radio. Thank you. Okay. On a repeater, identification data can be used the same as simplex. And you can also use the control cross-band operations. So here's a repeater, NC2EC, which I think is in Long Island, if I remember right. It has a module B and a module C on it, meaning a 2 meter and a 440. <clears throat> I can do the same kind of thing with the, with the call sign squelch, so that I put out a call on the repeater. I'm calling for KB1, QBZ. The other people don't hear me if they have call sign squelch activated. I can also, at the same time, I can also decide that I want to do cross-band repeat. Think about on our typical repeater, you have to, you have to get one of, the, one of the repeater trustees or the repeater operators to put on cross-band repeat, like you know, two meters to 440. On the typical D-star, you can decide, hey, I want to go out. I'm coming in on two meters. I want to go out on the 440 and the two meter. You just program that in here. When you press the button, it sends the signal to, when you press the push to talk, it sends the signal to the repeater to, to put your signal out on the, on the other band. Again, you got the little problem of, well, I call KB1 QBZ. He's listening on, uh, let's see, I said, um, I'm, I'm transmitting on module C. He's listening on module B. He hears me. He then has to know that I'm on module B, and he has to do something to tell his radio to tell the repeater, hey, put this out on module C so John can hear me respond. Because if he doesn't do that, it's not going to go out on my side of the repeater. I won't hear him. And how does he know which one you're on? Is well, it, the, it shows. It'll show, but you know, that, now you have to crawl. <laughs> there is one thing that all of them now have a little button, a one-touch button that says, you know, press that button. It takes whatever data he sent and puts it in. It, put, it, it, it sets it up in the, in the radio so that you're matching whatever it is he's sending you. So that's, a, you know, that's good, but you do have to know that. And you'll hear a lot of times, you know, you'll hear some guy calling and then some guy responding, and this guy calling, and this guy responding, and this guy calling, and this guy responding. And eventually, they'll figure out that one guy's on one side of the repeater, the other guy's on the other side of the repeater, and they never, they forgot to press the button. Also, with the call sign squelch stuff, now on the repeater, you can have the great fun and game of you hear one side of the conversation or you don't hear any part of the conversation. Um, the repeater is still in use. You know, this is not magically enabling you to use a repeater for multiple conversations at once. And you have that same problem of two guys are talking, somebody else doesn't hear, he breaks in or he comes in, he starts up a conversation, everybody's pissed at everybody else because nobody knew that anybody else was on the repeater. So, again, something you have to watch out for. Repeaters can be linked together into a zone. The ICOM sells a 10 gigahertz um, uh, radio. It's, it's meant as a link. It's a point-to-point -point link, obviously. Um, and you can set up zones. It's all set to do that kind of thing. Very nice. So, if we've set up a zone, I can, I can put in, I want to talk to KB1, QBZ on that repeater. Um, I'm sorry, I'm on, yeah, I'm on the W1NLK repeater. I want to talk to KB1, QBZ who's on that repeater. And it'll go through the zone, out to here, and I will talk to him. I won't break, it won't break squelch on this, it won't break squelch on that. Or it won't retransmit on this or that. It won't retransmit here, it won't retransmit there. It'll just retransmit here because that's what I put in. Again, there's a Q cell going on that's tying up all or part of that link. So, for example, if he, if WB2EAT, wants to talk to somebody in this repeater, he can't 
because I'm using this piece of that link. If I'm talking, if I'm over here talking to somebody over here, and he's over here talking to somebody over there, well then it, as it, it just happens that they can talk to each other on that one, in that one group, I'm sorry, in that one zone, because you know, they, they happen to not, nobody's using any shared piece of link. But if, if we're going across the link, then we're tying up four repeaters, or two repeaters. If we haven't done the call sign squelch thing and I haven't programmed it in right, I'm tying up four repeaters. No different than if you get a couple of repeaters together on echo link. Or no different than a link repeater system like we have in Connecticut, the, the, the uh, PVRA link repeater system. When you get on the PVRA link repeater system, you're tying up, what is it, eight, eight or nine repeaters, <clears throat> no matter who you're talking to. So if you don't do everything exactly right, you're tying up all the repeaters on that, on that zone. And while this has been pushed as one of the major benefits of, of D-Star, you rarely find anybody who set up these zones. Because if nothing else, nobody wants to go out and buy 10 gigahertz links. Okay. In general, <clears throat> digital does propagate further than analog on the same power. Why? Because I'm not setting that wide range of frequency. I'm just sending beeps and boops. Okay. GMSK itself usually does better than FM. So typically I'm going to go further for the same, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a good signal strength further out than I will with the same analog power, same antenna from the same location, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> also, typically a digital signal will stay fully readable over a long distance, longer distance than analog. Again, because I'm just sending those little beeps and boops, I'm <clears throat> not sending all the complication that's in human voice. Notice that when digital does start losing it, it loses it quickly. But over here, um, you know, at this point, maybe you're hearing three words out of every five. You're still hearing, well, sorry. At this point, yeah, you're still, you're hearing maybe three words out of five in an analog world. You're hearing everything in the digital world. Once you get here, at a, at a much higher level, you, you've lost all your digital signal all your readability of the digital signal. But typically you're getting further. You are getting further. Um, That's, yeah. How does that relate to the joys of Connecticut where we have the, where we're blessed with north-south ridges in the way? Propagation is propagation. If you've got a ridge in the way, then, then distance doesn't, doesn't matter. If I've got a 135 foot ridge and I, you know, and I'm at two feet above sea level, and you're at two feet above sea level, ain't gonna, ain't gonna work. It's all line of sight. It's all line of sight. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, where your digital breaks off, you can still get bits and pieces of words through on the analog. Yeah, at the point, you can get to a, a, a place where, uh, you, where you can hear a, word, a couple of words on your analog where you're hearing nothing in the digital. The digital has just stopped. But at that point, how many words are you hearing? Are you going to be able to understand anything that's said? Okay. You're going to be getting the repeater dropping in and out. So it's, yeah, you know, you might hear the one, the one place where that has some value at that point is at least you know somebody's there. And, and you know, um, uh, Christ, I'm drawing blank. Steve, uh, um, the guy who works for the state, uh, Verbal. Steve Verbal. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got the story of, of when they first started putting in digital radios in the fire department in New York. They were used to at least you'd hear something. You'd hear scratching. You'd hear, you know, <laughs> something. And, they, and then people would start running around with the radios to try to get a better signal because sometimes that was a fireman in trouble. With the digital, nothing happened. You know, the radios were dead silent. And so was the fireman who was desperately trying to call for help because the radio <laughs> didn't break squelch at all. So. It's, with the analog, you might know that somebody's there, but you're not going to be able to understand them. With the digital, you might not even know that somebody's there. Thank you. Now, there's this concept called R2-D2. And when you read anything on EHAM or QRZ, and the first thing you hear is, there was so much R2-D2, this thing was useless, I'm throwing out my goddamn radio. 
R2D2 is when these packets get corrupted, what happens a lot of times is you still hear something, but it sounds exactly like R2D2 from, Star from Star Wars. Almost worse than what John was doing back then. Okay? It really does sound like R2D2. It doesn't sound like any part of speech. It doesn't sound like a it doesn't sound like maybe a uh, you know syllable or a piece of a syllable. It just beeps and boops and, and stuff. People call it R2-D2. It's usually because of distance or reflection or some sort of interference. And for whatever reason, people totally perceive this as far worse than scratchies or repeater dropout than in the analog world. Nobody's really done any study, but when you, when you sit people down and you calm them down and you say, okay, guys, is it really any worse than, than dropout? Nah, eh, probably not. But you will hear everybody complain about R2-D2. I, I, I don't know why psychologically it's worse to hear that than it is to have the repeater drop out. You know, somebody lose the repeater. Okay, so that's, our, that's D star, just the radio portion of it, just the, the actual voice transmission. Um, now let's look at this network for linking. What ICOM has done is they've built a network, an internet-based network for linking D-star repeaters. And you can do some interesting things with um, routing and identification, all that kind of stuff. They call it the US Trust Server. It's down in Texas, I think Dallas, if I remember right, outside of Dallas. And anybody who's got a, a licensed D-star repeater can uh, connect to that. You connect through something called a gateway. It's an added program. It's actually a computer with a program uh, that you have to put on your repeater. You, you can't just plug it in. Um, brilliantly, at first, while ICOM was busy trying to build up interest in DSTAR, they said, if you don't have an ICOM repeater, we're not going to allow you on the US Trust server. So a lot of people who might have otherwise gone to D-Star said, well, screw you, we're not going to D-Star. They've finally figured out that you know, it wasn't a great marketing concept. So they're allowing non-ICOM repeaters onto D-Star, uh, I mean onto the US Trust Server. The US Trust Server keeps track of every D-Star repeater, anyone that's registered with them. And it keeps track of whoever has been on those repeaters. Big Brother is watching. Big, big Icon is watching. You have to register with them the first time. When, if you decide to, to get a, a D-Star radio and you want to be able to use this feature, you go on to a, there's a website, you go on, you give them your call sign, and from that point on, they'll track whatever repeaters you've been heard of. Now when I say heard, it's the data. <clears throat> it's hearing data, not your voice, okay? So it will know if I if I fly out to Colorado Springs and I get on whatever that repeater is out there, it will know. Typically within five minutes, once in a while something goes kablooey and it takes as much as forty-five minutes. But typically within five minutes, it will know that I was there. So this so this is the D Star equivalent of Echo Link. Yes, it goes beyond what Echo Link can do, but this is the D Star equivalent of Echo Link. But for data only. No, no, voice no, no, and data. Voice and data. It's, it's using the data side to do all this magic, but it's voice. I mean, it's, it's for voice type purposes. You'll see in a second. The first thing that they do, and this is the big thing that, um, that, that ICOM always talks about, is this thing called call sign routing. If I want to talk to KE7QFI, I don't have to know where he is. <clears throat> All I have to do is put out a call for KE7QFI. I put in the right things in here that say, hey, I want you to go out to the trust server and find him. It will go out to the trust server and it will find where it last heard KE7QFI and it will route my call to that repeater and that repeater only. So that's nice, but remember, it's basing that on the where he was last heard, where he was last transmitting. <coughs> And you, he has to have actively transmitted. It's not like your cell phone, which behind the scenes is sending out a signal every so it's often. Like you know, polling. So if, if KE7QFI was in Colorado Springs three days ago, and he's since moved on to Cheyenne, Wyoming, but he hasn't gotten on the repeater, my call to him will be routed to Colorado Springs. 
so <clears throat> be careful. <laughs> um, and again, the same, the same caveat. If everybody hasn't set up their call sign squelch right, and if he doesn't put in when, when he responds to me, if he doesn't, uh, you know, push push the button so that it's sending my call back and all that kind of stuff. Other people won't hear the conversation, or they might hear part of the conversation, or they might hear all of the conversation. And if somebody on that repeater, wherever he is, doesn't hear the conversation and gets on that repeater, he's going to interfere with them. I'm going to, you know, we're going to, they're going to interfere with us. So it can be a real double-edged sword. It can be very nice, but in fact, it can cause problems. In this case, the only repeater you're on and the repeater he, they think he's on, are affected. Right. That is correct. Yes. Um, this is this is something that that ICOM has been playing up big time. When you talk to people who are really into D Star, they go, eh, "I never use this." Okay, Jess and D One L, who's you know the the big the big Mr. D Star in this area. When I talk to him about, it, he says, "Well, tell the truth, I've never used it. Just nobody nobody uses it." Okay, you can also do repeater linking. So I know I want to get onto the BE7RAG repeater, which is, if I remember right, it's out in British Columbia, something like that. I can just punch in BE7RAG, again, you know, through the numeric keypad. When I press the button, if I've done it right, I will be routed to that repeater and that repeater only. No different than Echo Link, except remember with Echo Link, I have to look up a, an Echo Link node number and find out that node number. This way I'm doing it by the repeater call sign. And How long does it take you to program your HD? Depends. If I'm in practice, a minute or two. If, you know, when I haven't done it in a while, first I have to find the book, then I have to find the right pages in the book. And icon <coughs> manuals are terrible. You know, if, if there's a task like programming your, your, programming your radio to, to call, to link to a, another repeater, a piece of the task will be explained on page 57, another piece of it will be pay, explained on page 102, then the next piece will be explained on page 83, and then you'll get to page 91 and say, oh, forget all that you read, you know, now look at this instruction. And they're terrible manuals. If you're going to go D-Star, you really want the software and you want to program this stuff in with the software and download it to your radio. And you program in every possible combination and you just select them. Um, but this is... This is no different than echo link. And again, you have the caveat of the one side or the other side. You know, people hearing, not hearing. Finally, they have something called reflectors. This is sort of kind of like a, an echo link conference, where you can have a couple of uh, different repeaters all talking to each other. But it works a lot better, and it's a lot easier to set up. And mostly people set up these semi-permanent or semi-permanent reflectors. For example, the Norwalk is on 10C. It's, they've named them after computer ports, instead of giving them nice names. Um, reflector 10C covers a whole bunch of repeaters in New England. It's got a couple in New York State. It's got a couple in Ohio. I think there's a Virginia and a Pennsylvania. And, the, and for example, there's a net. Every Tuesday night, you get on, guy calls, calls the net, and you're hearing people from you know, Ohio up to Maine. Ohio and Pennsylvania and Virginia up to Maine, getting on this net and talking. It's no different than connecting up a bunch of repeaters to Echo Link so you can get more people so there's a chance that you'll actually have a conversation. That's all. Tie up more machines. Huh? And tie up more machines. And tie up more machines, because in that case, all of the machines are tied up for any conversation. Um, and again, some people may hear all of it, some people may hear part of it, some people may hear none. None of it, and you constantly hear, you know, there's WB2RYV and the Norwalk repeater monitoring. WB2RYV, this is, you know, K1XYZ up in Bangor, Maine. I'm in the middle of a conversation, you stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear him. Okay. Two other things uh, you've heard of, you've heard reference to, the DV dongle. The DV dongle is a, is a device that costs about $150. You plug it, it's a USB device, you plug it into your computer. And now you can talk across the D-Star network from your computer. Those of you who do Echo Link know that the Echo Link software lets you use your computer to talk anywhere on the Echo Link network, only you don't have to buy a dongle. You just have to you just use the microphone as normally in your radio, normally in your computer. 
with the Echo Link, I'm, I'm sorry, with the D-Star, you're buying the dongle because that's got the AMBE chip in it. And then you're using the, the regular microphone speaker that's in your, that's in your radio. But it's, it's like the Echo Link, except you have to spend $150 to be able to get your computer on the network. Um, you know, other, other than that, it's not significantly different. A DVAP, which is kind of nice, lets you create a local hotspot. It's a small transmitter receiver. You plug it into a USB port. Now, any D-Star radios within a couple of hundred feet can go right through your hotspot into the network. Now, you're going in the network. You're going via the internet. But, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've got a couple of people in an area, they all want to get on D-Star. You don't have a D-Star repeater handy. You use one of these DVAPs, and now everybody, you know, everybody in this building, for example, could then get onto D-Star. Everybody in this room, anyway. Cost two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars, something like that. It's nice. Uh, those of you who know, know Kurt, when he's out in the out in Aspen doing the Winter X Games, they set up one of these things, and you know, all the hams out there get on D Star and they talk, you know, using his D But if power's down, it's not going to work. Right. If the internet is down, it's not going to work. Notice all of this stuff is based on the internet. If the internet is down, so sorry. <clears throat> yep. Okay, and there is, there's really no equivalent to that DVAP. I mean, people have created their own little hotspots, but, but there isn't something nice that you can just go out and buy. You can buy a $60 wireless access point, and use your iPhone, and your, everyone your well, your yeah, iPhone, in, in, in the, the Echo Link thing. world. <laughs> Nobody's bothered with this in the Echo Link world. Okay, everybody says prices for D-Star, no, they're not really higher. That's, that's old, no, it's not really higher at all. And everybody will tell you, if you get onto a D-Star forum, if you talk to people on a D-Star, no, it's not true The prices for D-Star are higher, okay? As of last night, an ICOM IC2820H with the D-Star chip in it from HRO, $665. A Kenwood D710 with GPS in it and the TNC in it, $530. No, the D-Star equipment isn't more expensive. Okay, used on eBay, an IC2820H, 600 to $700, a Kenwood D710, 450 to 525 And I want you to notice something. This is not a typo. There are morons who are playing more for a used radio on eBay than they can buy it new from, from HRO. But it's already been burnt in and tested. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, same thing with the IC92. You know, look at the, look at the comparisons. There are, and what happens is sometimes people look at eBay and they go, ah, oh, there's an IC92 for sale, it's $200. Well, see, uh, on a, it's for sale on eBay, $200. See, the, the, the price has come down. And there's still six days left on the bidding. And those of you who bought things on eBay know that a lot of this stuff, it's the last five minutes when the price goes, you know, the price goes, boom, <laughs> like that. And these are... And this is the final price after build bidding. This is the sold price. So the prices are significantly higher than if you get an analog. I hear bad jokes. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. It's estimated that there are 10,000 registered active D-Star users in the, in, the, in the world, not in the U.S. How many? 10,000. Not a lot. Um, now, there may be many unregistered users. Registered means they've registered on the trust server. And by the way, most of the world uses that U.S. trust server. They, don't, they haven't built their own. Um, D-Star, why is it more popular? Well, first thing is, to a lot of people, it's a solution in search of a problem. What is it actually giving you? It's, it's got some nice features, but are they really worth spending a couple hundred dollars more for radio? If you want to play with those features, if your goal is to get something and play with those features, yeah, sounds, you know, it can be fun. But is it really something you need? I mean, let's face it, if I don't know where KE7QFI is at the moment, I'm not going to get on my D-Star and put out a call to him. I'm going to go, you know, blip, blip, blip. Hey, Erwin, where are you? <laughs> um, and if I can't do that by cell phone because the cell system is down, chances are the Internet's down also. So, you know. Um, the reduced bandwidth would be nice, but the FCC hasn't required reduced ham radio bandwidth. 
So we still have the, the 30K channel spacing here, 20K, you know, some parts of the US. It's not buying me anything. Pricing, we just saw. Uh, one, out in uh, Oregon, a one club, one Aries group uh, decided to convert to D-Star. I mean, Oregon for a while went D-Star crazy, and they were converting every D-Star. And for example, in Salem, which is the capital, uh, there was one Aries group that had 17 people who were really regulars. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, signed up and they never show for meetings. They showed up for meetings. They did everything. They had 17 people who were regulars. They said, we're going to D-Star. When the smoke cleared, they had eight people who were regulars. Because people just said, I'm not spending $2,000 or $2,500 to replace all the radios I have. I have a mobile in my car. I have a base station. I have two or three HTs. I'm not spending money to replace all of them. So, um, you know, price, that, that price is an issue. There is a perception that it's flawed. For whatever reason, partly because people don't always set their call, call sign squelch right, or people don't know how to program them right, things go wrong, R2D2, for whatever reason, seems to be much worse than, than dropout, and a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't work, it doesn't work nearly as good as analog. It's got more sophisticated features if you don't program, you know, if you don't plug, punch in your, your features correctly, yeah, it's not gonna work right. Operator error. Operator error. <laughs> Reliance on the internet for all the cool stuff. Everybody, a lot of a lot of Aries groups jumped at it and said, oh, it does all this great stuff. And then the first time there was a, a disaster, which happened to be out in Oregon, the internet was down. They couldn't do any things they wanted to do with it. So the perception of, well, it doesn't deliver. No, it, it delivers exactly what it promised to deliver. You, sh you, know, you know that the internet's going to be down in one of these disasters. Why were you planning on relying on it? Um, the radios are so-so. Um, for example, on the IC91 and the IC92, my insurance company will no longer pay for treatment for third degree burns I get if I'm hand holding my IC91 or IC92. And the ICOM approved asbestos oven mitten is $400. I'm not going to spend money on $400 for an oven mitten for, the, for this. These radios get incredibly hot. I mean, they're really bad. ICOM has never been known for being good about current, uh, you know, uh, uh, current consumption, amperage consumption, in their radios, especially in their ATs. Not frugal? Huh? Not frugal? Not frugal. This radio on 440 uses, consumes 2.2 amps on a, on a 1.4 amp hour battery. So you don't get a lot of talk time to begin with. And the battery can't deliver 2.2 amps. So if you transmit for more than about 45 seconds, when you release the push to talk, the voltage drops and the, and the radio shuts off. When I sent it back to ICOM to have it fixed, ICOM sent back, no, it's all within spec. This happens on about 30% of, uh, of the IC91s and 92s. Supposedly, they're a little bit better on the next generation, but there's still a problem with the current consumption because all ICOM radios consume a lot of power. They, they just haven't ever been frugal about it. <laughs> and then the other thing is the lack of support from other vendors. You gotta buy it from ICOM and pay, in, in, in essence, a, a uh, monopoly price. Stuff. You can do a lot of fun stuff with it, but what I want you to know is that there are a lot of the cool stuff that it supposedly does has its downsides too. So you can decide whether you want it, want to spend the money on it or not. And I think that's it. You Thank you. Out the best benefit, which is you can throw it down on the ground and stamp on it. <laughs> yes. What I, I don't, I didn't really hear any major pluses to this thing. Well, it's got those things. The question is, are those things really so <coughs> superb? Are they so special that it's worth spending the extra money? But a lot the, of people say no. The things no. you're talking about are all isolating things. You yes. know, like I only want to talk to him. Well, that's not ham radio, in my opinion. <laughs> you know? On, on, on FM, a lot of times it is. I really only want to talk to him. But you're right. I mean, Very the, the problem is it's a solution in terms of problem. I've got all this great stuff. Now, the DD... The, the, the high-speed data is a very nice thing. If you, need, if you have need for a 1.2 gigahertz uh, line of sight, high-speed data, for example, from Stanford Hospital Tully Health Center, if we could convince them to, to try it out, that would be a very nice thing, you know, to send 128K by radio. Um, but, you know, if you don't have need of that, now what do you need? I don't know. The, the, I, Again, you have to make up your mind, having these play toys, is it worth spending the extra money? Mm -hmm. 
it'll be a benefit when they all agree on one system yeah. and all the manufacturers have the same system. Right. Until then. And if the FCC says, you guys in the ham radio community are complaining about not having enough, enough frequencies, we can't give you any more, especially VHF, UHF, so you're, the only thing you can do is cut your bandwidth. Well, now I've got something at 6.25. And as opposed to the ICON, the, the Yezu, which is 12.5, which, you know, that, that, the 16 to 12.5 doesn't give me that much benefit. John? So, <clears throat> when you're using an E-Star mode, not an FM mode, uh, if I'm listening on the same frequency on a regular FM radio, I won't hear you. You'll either hear me or you'll hear what sounds like static. Depends on exactly what's being transmitted. That's a lot. Huh? That's a setup. <laughs> what do we mean? I'll hear you or hear static. Is there no, I mean, it depends on exactly <laughs> what's being transmitted. It'll sound like static. <laughs> if, if you hear me, if it's anything that the radio recognizes, if it breaks it squelch, squelch, it'll think it's static. It's it'll strong. think it's strong static. Yeah. Sorry. Is there much D-star <laughs> traffic in this area? Not really. There, there are a number of these, a couple of these star repeaters. I, I guess a number is a fair statement. Weka has one. There are at least two out in Long Island. Uh, Norwalk has one. There are Maryland. four or five others up in upstate. But when you listen in, they're tied into this 10C. If you think that our repeater doesn't get a lot of use <coughs> during the day, li listen in on on this radio. And nothing. Crickets? Huh? Crickets? Yeah. There's a, you know, a couple of people get on and they're just diehard D-Star and they want to be on this D-Star radio and they're not doing anything that they couldn't do with, uh, with Echo. Thank you.